Okay, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Joost Hosemans. I'm uh, talking to you from uh, the Netherlands. Um, I'm uh, working with the Accelerated Big Data Systems Group in uh, Computer Engineering Laboratory of uh, Delft University of Technology, um, where I'm uh, a postdoc. Here's a picture of our uh, campus, which is indeed this empty at this time. Um, so today um, I'm going to have a simple presentation. There's an introduction um, gradually uh, transitioning into some of the tools that we've developed that we think um, can be uh, very valuable to the community. Uh, and then uh, a couple of use cases that we've built using those tools uh, on uh, open copy systems. Uh, some results, and then there will be time for some uh, for some questions at the end. We can use the Q&A for that. Um, and I've also been told that you can drop them in the Slack so that uh, afterwards uh, I'll have a look uh, on there as well. We can continue the discussion. So uh, the Accelerated Big Data Systems Group, or ABS, as we uh, often call it, is uh, led by uh, Zeta Lars and uh, Peter Hofstey from uh, IBM. And we're working on um, different uh, layers of the technology stack in uh, a couple of um, application domains uh, related to big data. So here's uh, some pictures of our staff and your presenter is this. Hello, this is me. Um, and um, I'd like to let you know that most of the technology that we built is actually open source and we publish it on our Git website. So if you're interested, have a look there. Uh, most of the stuff that I will presenting, um, I'll be presenting here, you will be able to find there. Okay, so let's have a look at um, some of the trends that we're seeing in the big data um, world. Uh, let's start at, uh, at the software side of it. So um, in the old days, uh, computers used to be very expensive, large machines, mainframes, clusters, that were being programmed by um, uh, yeah, programmers that were writing very highly optimized code for it. It's been lots of effort on that. But in the last, um, yeah, in the last couple of years, this has changed a little bit. So currently it's actually often more economic to just add a couple of nodes to a rack of machines than it is to spend a lot of time optimizing code. So actually these costs, they've, they've uh, changed a little bit. And what we're seeing now is that um, for programmers or data scientists to run some code on a very large machine, there's now popular frameworks, for example, uh, Apache Spark, that allows, um, that have greatly increased accessibility of using very large clusters, sometimes even commodity hardware, um, to get the high performance for very large data sets using not really that much effort. So these frameworks provide very high levels of abstractions. They use scripting languages, sometimes even like Python or SQL. Um, they, um, they provide very high abstractions like record oriented tables. So all of these new technologies, they allow data scientists to create a new program, write a new query in a matter of days or weeks. Now on the hardware side, things have not been this easy. Let's call it easy. Um, so we're seeing that the creation of data volumes is still scaling along pretty much with Moore's law, right? It's still uh, very much exponential. But the rate in which the performance of CPU is increasing and I guess many of you have seen this graph dozens of times already. Uh, it's not it's not been scaling as quickly anymore. So um, what we would call vertical scaling, with which I mean adding compute resources to a single node to increase increase its performance, um, it's sort of le reaching the limit. So to make matters even worse, what we're seeing is that the throughput provided by storage and networking, it's slowly catching up with the speed in which a single CPU socket is able to access data 
from its uh, DRAM, from its main memory. So the classical, yeah, this is from a blog uh, that you might be interested in, uh, in reading. Um, so these observations, they more or less create this realization of that the classical rule of thumb that the CPU is fast and storage and network are slow. It's no longer the case. So this, mm, this gives us the idea, that gives us the vision that probably in the future, the data is not going to be processed purely by a bunch of CPUs anymore as it's, a, a, as it's been in the past. So what we're already seeing is a couple of these accelerators showing up, like for example, uh, there's of course the DPU and the, the TPU for AI uh, workloads. We're seeing smart NICs being um, introduced, accelerated storage uh, solutions. Uh, so there's already a, a, a little bit of acceleration being done in the present, but in the apps group, we're thinking that in the future, this will only increase to a situation where the CPUs will be there to more or less orchestrate the distribution of the workload over a bunch of accelerators each of which is very specialized to their particular task. So this, this being said, um, I guess this is also the reason that we're considering OpenCAPI as a very important uh, component in these future systems, not only because it's currently the highest performing, um, performing interconnect, but also because it allows your accelerator to function as a peer of the CPU instead of being a slave device. Um, and what I also uh, personally like very much is that OpenCAPI opens the door to, for example, other fabrics besides FPGAs, what are, what's currently used to create accelerators. So for example, is there's going to be uh, like a CG array based fabric or maybe even multi-project uh, wafer ASICs um, you will be able to connect them to your system through, uh, through OpenCAPI. So, um, as you're seeing, uh, I kind of set up this, um, this contrast here where on one side we have software um, creating these high level abstractions. Um, and on the hardware side, you know, th there's a reason we're calling it accelerators. They're supposed to be very fast, faster than the CPU, which means that they need to be highly specialized. You are working with very optimized um, um, hardware designs um, that can take an FPGA designer months to implement on an FPGA. So on the one hand, you have these um, software um, pulling towards uh, higher levels of productivity, easier programming, quicker time to solution. And then on the other side, we have hardware requiring more low level implementation, more difficult to develop for. So we're seeing these, this big gap and we think that is, it's, it's, I think it's increasing earlier than it will be decreasing. So um, this, is the, um, this is where the apps group is, um, is working uh, primarily on trying to address this discrepancy, this gap between the software and the hardware world. And we're doing this particularly in the big data um, application domain because the big data application domain gives us also, besides these challenges, a couple of opportunities. So let's have a look at that. Um, here I have a, yeah, a, a, an, an example like the hello world of big data analytics, right? This is, um, this is word count. Um, you can find this on the Spark uh, website as probably their first example. Uh, what does this look like internally in, in Spark? It gets represented as, um, as a graph, a uh, directed acyclic graph with a couple of uh, operations like transformations. Um, so these transformations, they are very parallel programming construct, these patterns um, and that combined with the graph representation, both of these uh, are actually quite suitable to map to an FPGA. 
because you can lay them out on the chip, you can unfold them. So as long as there's room left on the FPGA, you can uh, keep adding uh, units and add parallelism. Um, so this is actually um, an opportunity. For example, if we look at this graph and say, okay, maybe we can map these two operations that I've highlighted in green here to an FPGA. What would this look like? For example, you can say, um, I'll have a look in my library to see if I have any, if, if there is any components that I already have, or maybe you can uh, implement them um, that are able to perform this transformation on FPGA. Um, then you can synthesize them to um, to an FPGA, and then what you need is, of course, you need to interface that to your big data framework. Um, and I'm actually quite proud to say that uh, last year in the group, we, we've made a proof of concept that does actually this whole workflow. Is, uh, we built a prototype that does this, and it will be presented uh, in, a, in a later uh, presentation by uh, Akos and Fabian, who are two students of ours. So if you're interested in, uh, in this, they're going to talk uh, more in depth about it. I'm not going to steal too much of their thunder. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit more about um, this infrastructure. How are you going to interface uh, this? And um, some more of the tools that we've developed that, um, that actually facilitates um, designs like these. So um, yeah, on the software side, these big data frameworks, they're they're, very, they're not using bits and bytes, they're using strings and characters and the tables. Um, and on the hardware side, if, you're, if you want to write data into an FPGA, you're probably using AXI. It's very byte oriented, there's bits, there's gates. So again, there's this big gap, right? Um, and um, in the apps group, we've developed a software framework that actually generates the interfaces that are able to make this transition. And this was the topic of, um, of, um, of a talk at the last year's summit, and it's called Fletcher. So I'm not going to talk a, a lot about it, but uh, just to recap um, that, um, that topic as well. Um, yeah, oh yeah, I should probably mention, Fletcher is able to do this uh, because it relies on the in-memory uh, format that's called the Apache Arrow that specifies how data is supposed to lay out so that you don't have to copy and convert it between different big data frameworks or in this case big data frameworks and FPGA. So Fletcher is an interface generator which means that if you have an application uh, with the um, corresponding schema of how the data is laid out Fletcher will generate interfaces and um, OpenCAPI is uh, one of the interfaces that, um, that we support. It's actually probably our favorite one. Um, and then on the kernel side, instead of having to worry about where your data is located and interfacing with AXI and uh, uh, finding, uh, finding the correct location and everything, you can just specify which record you want, which element from your schema and you will receive that data in a stream that is uh, very high performing. And um, yeah, for the rest, the infrastructure side is being taken care of uh, for you. So if you're interested, here's a publication uh, about that at FDL last year. So that's part one of this interfacing question, right? The second part is once the data is on the FPGA, um, how do you communicate it between the components? Because again, FPGAs, they work with bits, buses, there's timing involved. Um, and on the software side, you just want to say, okay, I have this data structure, I want to send it from one place to another. Um, this is why, and I think this is probably one of the most interesting results from the group in the past year. Um, we've pro proposed a specification to do exactly this, to represent data on the wire on, for example, on FPGA or other digital hardware. Uh, this was published in IEEE Micro uh, uh, this year. So just to give an example, if you have a, a structure that has a timestamp and, and an array of a couple of strings, right? Uh, normally in software, um, 
you express it in a struct or in whatever uh, kind of uh, data structure that is uh, normally used. And it gets mapped according to how this language works into your memory, into this, um, yeah, um, it's basically a, a one dimensional array of cells. Um, and you always know what it will look like because the language will take care of it for you. But if you want to send this data on hardware between components or whatever, you need to figure out how you're going to express this, right? So you need to write some interface that can actually encode and um, interpret this uh, this data. There's no there's no way that you can do it um, in some kind of industry standard fashion. So this is why um, we've proposed to do it. Uh, this is why we proposed uh, tidy, because tidy actually specifies how this transfer should look like in hardware. So instead of the one dimensional memory, we say, okay, a stream has two dimensions, which is the width of the bus. And then of course there's the transfers each clock cycles. So if you develop a component that uses the tidy interface specification, you know exactly how the data will look like and how to interface uh, with it. So this will help um, increasing design reuse uh, interoperability a lot. Um, so going back to this picture we've seen before, um, the blue interfaces uh, are generated by Fletcher and then the, um, the data that is being sent between Fletcher and between the components, um, we can specify how this, how this will work using Tidy. So another way to look at this is to see um, Tidy as, um, in, in the same way as a file format specifies how data should be lay, laid out on disk or other types of storage. And an example that I'm giving here is uh, Apache Parquet because it's very popular in uh, big data analytics. Then um, Apache Arrow specifies how data should look like in memory to allow um, cooperability between different uh, programming languages and frameworks. And then Tidy specifies how this data will look like on the wire, on digital hardware, on FPGAs or ASIC. So um, actually we think that um, Tidy could be spiritual successor of AXI, for example, because currently AXI is the industry standard for uh, connecting IP cores. But uh, Tidy is uh, much more powerful to, um, to express uh, interfaces. You can even express an AXI interface using Tidy if you would want to. So um, now let's continue with some other tools that um, create more or less uh, a flow of creating designs uh, around uh, big data analytics, right? So um, starting with uh, Apache Parquet, which is the, um, a very popular um, format that, uh, that data is often stored in, um, we've actually implemented a decoder for this so that you can fetch uh, a file directly from storage onto your FPGA, then write it into an arrow table so that your CPU can uh, continue processing on it after it's being decoded on your uh, FPGA. Of course, we use Fletcher to write these uh, arrow tables. Um, and um, then the, the next step is, okay, often these parquet files are compressed using Snappy, which is a um, compression standard uh, developed by Google. Um, so we've also developed a snappy decompressor unit that will be able to uh, decompress this data, stream it directly out uh, using Fletcher, for example, to write it into your host uh, DRM, so that uh, basically you free your CPU of the task to decode and decompress this data, and you can um, run your queries uh, on it uh, with, uh, without losing any cores uh, to, the, to the first steps. So for example, uh, we're seeing, okay, in the future, you will have uh, accelerated storage uh, situations where you have a file in uh, non-volatile memory, for example. Then you decompress it on your uh, open copy uh, connected FPGA and it gets uh, written into your DRAM ready for, um, for your query uh, to be run on it. But you know, you can also say, okay, let's instead of writing it into DRAM directly 
let's do uh, a part of our query on it on FPGA as well. So think back to the um, use case that I've described uh, before, right? Where you can uh, um, implement a kernel based on your uh, your application graph. Uh, and our student uh, Agos actually made a composition language that will help you to create these uh, kernels. It's, uh, he, he called it Tidal. He will talk about it some more in his presentation. Um, and for example, something that we're currently working on, it's still work in progress is, okay, you want to um, work on this data using, you know, not just one kernel, you, just, you, you probably want to have several kernels operating in parallel. But in that, that case, you need uh, to buffer this, um, this file, this data, and then distribute it to all of the kernels which is difficult in FPGA because you have very limited BRAMs, um, normally speaking. Uh, so we're developing an HBM buffer that, uh, that does exactly this, reads in a file that has a certain uh, block size and then it feeds all of these blocks into uh, parallel uh, kernels. So if you're uh, keeping an eye on the GitHub, you'll probably see it appear soon. So uh, next, I'd like to mention a couple of other uh, tools that, um, yeah, you can call it an FPGA design toolbox. They're meant to help you create these kernel designs. So for example, um, Fletcher uh, makes use of a structural RTL generator called uh, Karata. Um, there's a regular expression compiler uh, so that you can do filtering in um, in the first steps of your uh, your query, you can move that to the FPGA uh, quite easily. Uh, there's a streaming component library. There's a control register generator, uh, and the dependency resolver. It's quite um, handy for uh, starting uh, uh, simulations and uh, testing, uh, creating a test infrastructure. So for example, the regular expression matcher generator, it basically generates circuits, um, like for example, in SQL, you have an R-like statement uh, and it uh, synthesizes them into, uh, into an, uh, a state machine. Uh, that's actually quite um, um, effective on, uh, on FPGA. Um, there's the streaming component library that has a bunch of very useful building blocks like FIFOs, like uh, with conversion, which is called uh, the serializer. Uh, register slices to improve performance, um, to improve timing performance on the FPGA, etc. Then we have the uh, memory mapped register generator, which is also, uh, it saves you a lot of time because you can basically give it um, a file with, a, with the fields that you want, and it generates a component for you in, in VHL. It has an oxy slave interface, it has the register interfaces that you've asked for, and it will generate a documentation. Um, and in the future, we, we, we we're planning to also include uh, generated C headers because, yeah, that would uh, also uh, help writing your device drivers for it. So let's go through a couple of uh, use cases that uh, we've built using these tools. Um, and uh, I'd like to show the test system that we are using for, um, for most of our work. Uh, it's based on an uh, open power uh, system uh, from Inspur. So the dual socket uh, power nine system with, uh, with an alpha data card that has uh, HBM. So I think this is a very, um, um, good uh, setup to do uh, research. And um, here are some results for our uh, parquet uh, decoder. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, the plain version, which is just a bunch of ints, it achieves uh, 12 uh, gigabytes uh, per second, uh, mostly because we're using the 512 bits version of OCXL. But uh, Bruno has been helping me to try to get the 1024 version working as well. So I hope to, uh, to get some uh, updated results on this uh, soon. Um, but actually for the more difficult encodings like the delta and the strings, the advantage of using CPU is, uh, is actually very clear uh, here. Um, so then uh, for the snappy decompressor, I basically have um, 
some results in the table here, but the most interesting part of this is that the um, resource utilization is actually very modest and you can uh, achieve uh, very high performance. So in this case, you only need a couple of uh, parallel instances to get the maximum bandwidth. Now, uh, what we also did is we made a Wikipedia search demo that searches through the entire data set of text without an index. Um, and this we basically did by um, parallelizing uh, the workload over three times uh, five kernels, um, each reading from a DDR uh, bank. Uh, and they're being decompressed by our snappy decompressor and then they're going to a matcher. Um, and the results, yeah, there, there's even a nice uh, GUI. This was a demo uh, that we've uh, created. Uh, and the result is that if you uh, put this up against a dual socket CPU system, speed up this even uh, five times. Um, and I have to mark remark here that, of course, we're not purely looking for CPU speed ups. We're actually targeting to build like a more holistic system where you distribute the workload according to which computational fabric makes the more sense, right? But it does show that the FPGA um, can show a lot of uh, benefit here. Um, and then the last uh, and probably most interesting uh, result, I have to keep it for uh, my students because I don't want to steal it uh, from them. So I would like to ask you, stay tuned for their presentation. It's going to start at 11.45 in the same track and uh, they will tell you all about it. So um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, for um, being in, uh, in this presentation with me today. today. And uh, if there's any questions, please let me know. I'll, um, I'll also join the Slack uh, later, but uh, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll, I, I should be able to give, you, um, to give you the floor. Thank you. So I'm seeing a question by uh, Zaid uh, about the speed up that we were seeing for the parquet to error converter. I guess I should be able to pull up that slide again. So currently for the delta and the strings um, encodings, I would say it's, it's about 3x, but 
I do have to say that both of these designs, we can still improve if we use a uh, parallel prefix, uh, some implementation, because the current implementation uh, is difficult to, uh, to achieve time enclosure. Uh, so basically the, the, the widths of these designs are 256 bits. And with open copy, we can go up to 1024. So in principle, if, if we can get uh, them, uh, if we can fix the timing, this can go all the way up to uh, 20 gigabytes uh, per second, approximately. In that case, it would be over uh, over 10x. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's hypothetical. So I'm seeing a question from uh, from Peter about our vision of um, of getting to multiple FPGAs. Um, yeah, so we were working with a with a big roadmap in the group uh, over the past year, and I think the students responded to that. Uh, yeah, I think it really resonated with them. So before we knew, we had an army of students uh, working on our uh, on our vision um, for these. Um, yeah, for accelerated big data systems. And one of the aspects of this was obviously, uh, instead of focusing on getting these kernels on one FPGA, how to distribute them over multiple FPGAs. Uh, so we did a project to combine it with uh, Desk, which is actually uh, distributed uh, pink. Um, for that, we, uh, we used, um, yeah, basically they were pink uh, bit streams, but in an ideal world, we, should be able to distribute these kernels uh, over uh, over multiple FPGAs uh, as well. And then whether it's Dask or uh, or whether it's a Spark or another big data um, analytics framework, they will have to co cooperate in distributing the workload between them. Um, but basically, it it um, I think it's. Uh, it's more or less in the same order of magnitude in terms of difficulty to distribute it over multiple kernels uh, as uh, distributing it over multiple FPGAs and even on multiple uh, machines. But there, uh, there has to be some software support uh, for it. And uh, yeah, we're, we're thinking about that. And this is also something we discussed with Akos and, uh, and Fabian as well, of course. So I'm seeing a question from Alan. Uh, by the way, thank you all for the questions. Um, the question is how transparent is this to a programmer uh, when you're using Spark um, with, uh, with Python? Um, and I, I, have, I have to be honest that it's kind of the topic of uh, Akros and Fabian's presentation as well. So I can't go in, into too much detail. But uh, I do have to say that currently there is still uh, a manual step, which is the, um, the composition language I mentioned uh, that, uh, that's called Tidal. Um, but this language basically has a one-to-one -one mapping with many of these parallel patterns like map and reduce. Um, so it has all the potential to in the end become more or less an intermediate representation uh, yeah, all to, to go towards this transparency of, um, of not having a programmer intervene or an FPGA designer intervene. That being said, of course, I still believe that there will be situations where uh, an actual FPGA designer or a data flow engineer or whatever you will call it, will want to look at optimizing a kernel because if you're using FPGAs, there's a lot of opportunity to do much more, for example, using um, application-specific um, uh, number, rep well, not number representations, but uh, precisions, right? And you analyze the precision that every variable needs um, so that you don't have to use 64 or 32 bits for every uh, value that you, where you don't need it. So I think in some cases there is still value in having an actual engineer 
look at these designs. So I do think that you will still want to give the opportunity to intervene and to, to create manual designs and to very easily integrate these manual designs uh, and reuse these, these manual designs, for example, in IP core uh, libraries that were also uh, in the end um, looking towards uh, implementing as well. Yeah, I think that uh, library based acceleration is, uh, is going to be uh, very important um, in the future in some way or another. So, um, Peter is asking about Tidal and whether it may be useful for ASIC design and whether it can coexist with uh, Oxy or be used together with Oxy. Um, and I believe that both uh, answers are yes. I think Tidal can be very uh, useful for, uh, for ASIC uh, design, um, but the advantage is I do think probably larger for FPGAs just because they're more dynamic, right? So it allows a software engineer to change his data structure a little bit, then generate a new interface for it, for the FPGA very quickly, which on an ASIC, uh, in an ASIC situation uh, will not happen as quickly. But in the future, maybe when multi-project wafers are going to become more and more popular because the price of it is, is slowly dropping and the tools are uh, becoming available. I just saw on the, on the keynote, which is very cool. Then uh, who knows, maybe more and more people will start uh, designing data flow ASICs. Uh, and in that case, uh, of course, yeah, Tidal can be very useful for uh, IP core reuse and uh, in the connecting in different data flow components uh, together. And so combined with the, with the composition language that, um, that Aquash created, uh, I think that we're going into a very interesting direction. 